So, uh, great to meet you all. Um, I think I've met some of you at the last Brand Innovators that Samsung and Chair hosted last month. Um, so I'm Simon, I look after our partnerships and influencers um, at Samsung, we're over in Plano. And it's a pleasure to talk today um, from Origin. Um, we're gonna switch it up a little bit. I'll ask a few questions and then halfway I'll stop for audience questions and then we'll go back to some other questions because we always run out of time, audience questions, and that's the most interesting part of the session. So, Dave, great to meet you. Um, maybe I'll let, great to be here. I'll let you do a quick bit of blurb around Origin, um, and then I'm always curious, how did you get to where you are? And I want to hear about one of your biggest mistakes, lessons. Well, biggest mistakes right at the jump. Along the way. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll relive that trauma, and that'll be a nice way to start off the panel for me. Um, all right, I'm Dave Rosner. I'm the CMO of Autogen. We are the leading data activation, curation, and activation platform. So I know we've had a great morning talking about uh, creative activations and big ideas and strategy, and now we just want to take you all the way down to the plumbing of how everything is working and data. Uh, Simon and I are committed to bringing the energy in the room way down and getting you there. I hope you're ready for that. I hope, I hope you're sitting there saying, I can't wait till the data guy gets up. Um, I used to be a software engineer, so uh, I'm... All right, all right, we'll, we'll see. We'll see who can get more granular. This is gonna be a fun panel for us. Um, so Autogen works with brands and agencies and publishers to make sense of data and use it to more effectively work in programmatic. Uh, we may or may not talk about that more. Um, I've had, um, I'm the CMO, I've been working, running marketing for advertising and media companies for the past 10 years. I ran the innovations practice at an agency, um, and before all that, I was a bass player. Um, all right, biggest failure. Uh, I think this is such an interesting question because I've been so intimidated in the audience of some of these sessions because a CMO will come up and they will tell their uh, career history, and it will be, so, it will sound so amazing and so effort, effortless. Uh, I was an assistant marketing manager, and I was the one who figured out X, and then people recognized that, and all of a sudden I was running the X account, and then I got a call, and then I'm CMO, right? So it's like those seven or eight journeys, um, and I'm thinking back to, and I can't remember who it was, telling that story at um, South by Southwest, um, I think it was the head of marketing for Crocs. I was like, that is an incredible story. And nothing like what my experience as a marketer has been like. Um, my experience has been stops and starts and fails and learning along the way. So my traumatic experience, I was um, just back to New York. I was a touring musician um, after college. Just back to New York and I was in my first job in advertising and it was a super grind. We were pushing out like, a hundred ads a week, and we had to use a fax machine. All right, don't worry about that. It's like passing a noted class um, to like make sure the right to make sure the right ads were getting to the right places. And it was in retail. It was actually for a mobile uh, company, so we were selling cell phones back in the day uh, before the iPhone. And I had to sneak out early in the afternoon to take an interview. One of my old bosses had gone to another agency, a direct marketing agency. I was at a creative agency. At the time, that was the coolest. And so I go into this office, and if you're familiar with either of the Blade Runner series, the last interview of the afternoon is like in a Blade Runner office. It's in the, it was in the Grace Building. There were TVs and tiles in the floor. It was an infinite view of New York City out of the window. And we started talking about music, so I was super into it. And he's like, hire that guy. And I, um, and I didn't take the job. So meanwhile, back in the office, because it was only 6 o'clock, ads are going to the wrong place. It's a big mess. <laughs> and so I always thought that was a career moment for me where I decided not to specialize in one area of advertising and stay a generalist. Um, and I really felt like, wow, that was the moment that defined my career. And I was thought that was true, and then 20 years later, what happens? I actually, the world moves, and direct marketing becomes the underpinning for everything successful that's happening among CMOs today. Because uh, when I was starting in marketing, it was much more about a winning message. There weren't so many platforms, so if you got it right, you could get it to all of America pretty easily. Today, 
CMO also has to be a CTO and a CFO, and we were just talking about the power of data and the responsibility of marketing to show impact. So the folks who started in direct marketing had a huge advantage. So I ended up what I thought was on a very different career path and ended up in the exact same place. So I would say, if as a marketer, you will make terrible decisions, but as long as you are working as hard as you possibly can to get what, you're, what the opportunity in front of you provides, it, it all works out. You just have to have a little faith in yourself. But that was like, that meeting was my heart sunk, and I was like, this is it. That was my career-defining moment, which path to choose. And it turns out, you'd be surprised, sometimes it takes a long time, the paths reunite. Okay. We feel for you. <laughs> um, so let's get to business. So I think the, I'm reading the title of this session, it mentions channels and it mentions consumers. Um, so I want to talk about multi-channel marketing. Um, so I think as marketeers, we look at multi-channel marketing and I think most of us think we're doing it, doing great, doing okay, reaching consumers across multiple touch points, connecting the dots. As a consumer, uh, I think multi-channel marketing is terrible. Um, so, you know, it, whether it's getting an email for something um, or for a product that you bought only last week from the same company, trying to stay with the same product, through to, uh, you know, going onto the web and your consumer journey being the same as any other consumer, even, even if you're a 10-year loyal customer. So why is multi-channel marketing so hard? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and our prep session has inspired a lot of interesting conversations that I've had about this exact question. Um, I think the first part is it's actually complicated in and of itself. So let's say you had 10 different marketing tactics, and you could put them in any order. 10 factorial is about 3.6 million. And then if you could say some of those tactics aren't going to work, add another 400,000 combinations. So it actually fundamentally is a complex thing, which is why everybody in this room is so important to the industry. Um, the next piece is there are, there are now players in the marketplace that control big pieces of your data that you don't have visibility into as a brand. So the big wall garden platforms aren't sharing your data through, so no matter what, you're going to have to Frankenstein together a holistic view of your consumer. Um, I would say the opportunity is to find partners to simplify where you can, so it's not as bad, uh, so it's not as con confusing as it needs to be. And we see that all the time. So at Autogen, um, we can run every channel for a brand through a DSP and really optimize across all those channels. You can still run into some of those issues, um, but at least in where you have control, you can assume your control and find the partners to help you do that. Um, I will say one thing, because everybody hates the retargeting, um, and this is something that we can actually work on as an industry. One of the biggest challenges we see when we help brands with this is, we look to see how many retargeting partners a brand is using on a campaign. If you're using multiple retargeting partners, you are making it almost impossible to control that consumer journey. What you're going to find is in the back end, Oh yeah, let's get into the plumbing of the internet. It's just getting technical down. If you guys can just get your, your, get your uh, pocket protectors out. Um, what you'll see in the back end is you're bidding against the same inventory and you'll have multiple incredible partners who are very much incentivized for one piece of attribution. I will guarantee you they will prove that the incremental money you spent with them delivered on retargeting. But what you're actually doing is going after the exact same group of people to retarget from different partners, and in some cases, bidding yourself up. So it looks great from the partner analytics. Actually, in the back end of the internet, it just looks like you're creating more competition for the same person. So simplify your retargeting strategies so you have that control. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all. Now, we are really good as an industry at spending, overspending, or spending blindly because it's efficient. So that's the real brand choice. If you want to be thoughtful with your consumer and not have them see that pair of shoes show up on the sidebar that they just bought, then it just it requires a little more control um, over how you're spending. 
And so are there, um, what are the, the top three kind of recommendations, um, lessons that if you were a brand manager sat in this room that you would, you would advise? Yeah, first one is find a partner that you can work with that will help you with your multi-channel. So you're, not, you're gonna have to do a lot of smart, um, smart work in the back end to understand the interactivity between the wall garden platforms and everything else, but you can do that. You actually have the data. Um, I think the second piece of that, which goes right to it, is um, you have to understand your first party data strategy and your consumer data strategy. So you can only, you can only control this if you know what's happening. Um, this is something that if we talk about the cookie-less future is going from a important to have to a must have. Um, but you have to, you, sh you need to have your own data strategy and you need to be able to use your own data to stitch together what the truth is across your partners. And then, um, and then I think you have to choose, you have to choose those partners and push them and ask the right questions to understand that consumer journey and sometimes make the hard choices to test and learn. So you can see um, and model out, okay, I had these, 15 tactics. I'm going to have to prove middle metrics across those tactics and then extrapolate that across my plan because nobody can do it for me. So get your partners, get your data in line, and then model it out so you can create your own source of truth inside the brand. Okay, cool. So you mentioned cookies. Oh, yeah. Um, and the cookie loss future. Can you explain what that is? I'm sure some of the... Yeah, let's just get a show of hands. Who knows what the cookie loss future is or cares about it? My hands okay. down. Your hands different. Because I don't know what it is. If you don't want, oh, I thought you didn't care about it. If you don't care about it, we can talk about something else. If you talk about TVs and phones. Um, all right, cookie is future. Right now, the way all media is transacted digitally is with the backbone of um, a piece of code that captures consumer information. That's a third party cookie. What does a third party cookie capture? Everything. It captures everything it possibly can because when the internet was originally set up, we didn't know how big it was going to get, and we were like, all right, let's capture it all. Let's get your information, let's get your phone, let's tie that to your phone number, look where you are, all that information, why not? Well, it turns out the digital piece of advertising got a little bigger than we thought it was going to get. In fact, it got bigger than everything else, and now we're like, well, that's a lot of, that's a lot of data about me and my family, and I know there are a lot of good partners, but I'm worried about some of the other players in the space. Okay. So third, the cookie deprecation is the government, through, um, through legislation called CC, CCPA GDPR, and Google have said, we're going to get rid of this device that makes all of advertising work, um, because we think it's, it requires too much personal information on each person. And so it's becoming very, very complicated. Google has been talking about this, as you've heard about Google's privacy sandbox for two or three years. January, they start deprecating the cookie. So 1% of these identifiers that track everything, they're gonna pull out of the system so people can start to see what it's gonna, what's gonna happen. I will tell you right now, working across the entire digital ecosystem, so publishers, DSPs, DMPs, DSPs, all the Ps, um, things are gonna break. Things are gonna break that you think were gonna break, like, for example, if cookies are gone, 85% of your audience targeting, immediately gone. Immediately gone, 85%. So you're like, that's not a big deal. I'll just use contextual advertising. Great. Contextual advertising is going to shoot through the roof in cost because everyone's going to go to contextual. So we're talking about a very fundamental shift in the ability to even reach consumers within budget parameters. So everything is about to break. Nothing is going to be okay, and it will be both the things that you are, think are obvious, like, oh, addressability, I know I have to reach my consumer, and some of the things that aren't obvious, like, how am I going to connect my data that I'm already using in the ways that I'm used to using it? Can you put that into context in terms of the data that's going to be lost or not be accessible when this change happens? So if I'm, if I'm Samsung and I want to reach, and I'm going to make this up, but I want to reach iPhone 15 owners who have a propensity to behave in a certain way and visit certain places and visit certain websites and have two kids 
like how does how does that access to that kind of data change on January the first? That target you'll have no problem reaching. Everybody else will be a problem. <laughs> That's true. Um, so January first, you won't you'll feel it a little bit, right? So I, I think the best analogy for those who went through Apple's changing regulation and what it meant to everybody's Facebook business. Uh, I worked with a lot of brands. It tanked. Facebook went from being their number one generator of revenue to a complete free fall. They had to redo their revenue projections. So it's going to be that kind of moment. So Apple has already pulled third-party identifiers off of their app in this way, which is why Facebook, uh, Facebook advertising uh, had such a dramatic change in its efficacy. Um, Google is now pulling it out of Chrome. So what you're going to find is when the cookie is no longer available, you won't be able to get all those parameters, uh, period. You're, you will be able to, on a couple of closed platforms that have full control of their data, right? This is back to the wall gardens. You may be able to uh, approximate it, but the problem is, from the first question, they have all the data, so they're not going to tell you enough information for you to effectively do your multi-channel marketing and understand what's happening and build on your successes. They're going to hold some of that information, so you're going to lose control because you won't have as many uh, options in the marketplace. So that's what happens if you haven't approached it. But there are certainly a lot of companies that I think are opening up the door to solve for that huge um, impending drop in addressability. So on that note, what do are, what are brands do, brand managers, you know, media managers, do over the next 6, 12, 18 months to address this? I think 6, 12, and 18 months is absolutely the wrong time frame for thinking about this. So let me just say that uh, in this room. It's kind of like, what should you be doing today? What should, you be, what should you be doing for the next three months? What should you be doing for the next year and then after? Um, today, everybody in this room, and, and I think I'll count today, should just be learning about what this means, that the cookie and uh, cookie deprecation could have a massive impact on their business. So just learn about it. It's, you know, you'll be shocked if you haven't heard about this topic or dived into it, how much, um, how much good content there is. Um, Autogen is the, no, is the number four cookie-less identifier. So what you're going to start hearing about is other solutions besides the cookie that help track and target uh, potential audiences. Um, in ways that don't take as much um, private data. So there's a lot of resources to get smarter about alternative IDs right now. I would say in the three-month timeline-ish, um, for the brands in the room, test uh, and work with your agency partners. So um, there's someone here who you might have seen who's an amazing MC, and we're working with her agency on all kinds of tests of the Google Sandbox. Agencies have the best opportunity, oh, that's you. Uh, agencies have the best opportunity to look across their portfolio and set up more tests than any one brand could bring on its own. Bring on its own. They have more scenarios, so push your agency, get involved with your agency for that testing, and then choose your partners. Uh, you should be interviewing partners, um, and with these questions in mind of, okay, I know it's working well now, what are your plans for um, Q3, Q4 when full cookie deprecation starts hitting? And uh, what are we doing together? Uh, because I think, you no, know, you don't want to go into the second half of the year, which is so critical with a massive change in the business that hasn't been planned for. So you said, uh, I think you said 1% of uh, Chrome users will be impacted in January. When does that get to 100%? So it's looking to 70-ish percent by Q3, Q4. Now they have pushed the deadlines. Um, they have pushed the deadlines three times. Um, but we are, we are meeting with them as Autogen with the Google Sandbox team twice a week at this point because uh, we work with brands and we work with publishers and we work with agencies and we work with every major data company. So we, we bring a lot of voices to the conversation to say to them, we know you're committed to this. There are a lot of industry bodies that are looking at what, what's going to happen and they're saying, hey, do you guys know that this thing is going to just break? It, when the cookie goes away, so there's organizations like the IAB, and there was an interesting article about Beeler, who represents a lot of Beeler Tech, which re represents a lot of publishers, um, about his conversations with Google. So, um, so it, it will hit in earnest the second half of next year. And if I was betting, I would say much towards further towards the end of the second half. Okay. 
So I know we're about halfway through, maybe. So any questions from the audience? This is, I think, such a fundamental change that I'm curious. Uh, I have a lot of questions and comments. I'll try to truncate it. But from a marketer perspective, if you already have a pool of data, cookies, wouldn't you want to prioritize the transition of those cookies into first party known data? I'm throwing a bunch of terms out, right? Uh, so you can keep the value of it, understanding that the cookie is going away. And then the follow-up to that is, you mentioned alternative IDs. Those alternative IDs are only as good as the inventory available to use them with it. So the ecosystem you're creating. So as marketers, if someone has a solution for you, you have to bet how large of a solution that is within the inventory that you can run it against, so you can scale and run at the same budget levels and have the same impact. That wasn't really a question, I guess. But. I, I, I think I could tease a question out of there. And I'm going to start with the first, the importance of first party data. So the first part is, um, if I have some of my own customer data, how can I use that to get ready? I think it's that. Or if I have a little bit of my customer data, um, I now would be the time to focus on pulling those customers and increasing that relationship so you can increase your own first party data. So what we're really talking about, if you have first party data, you will still be able to use that. Um, so that's your first party data cookie pool. And I think it's so critical to have conversations around a brand's first party data strategy or just their data strategy. But I want to throw it to you because um, you have a deep background in data. And is this something that is discussed in, the, in Samsung and What's the first party data strategy? Yeah, we're fortunate that we have a lot of first party data. So um, we have scale, right? Because we have um, a large install base across mobile, TV, home appliances, digital appliances. We have connections across those products. So if you are a you know, premium Samsung Galaxy owner and you own a premium Samsung frame TV, then we must have a premium, premium customer and we would adjust our marketing uh, appropriately. I think what the challenge we have is frequency. So you know, you buy a phone every two years, you buy a TV every three years. And so whilst we have a lot of data and a lot of touch points, we don't have a lot of frequency of, of interaction with our consumers. So I think that's, that's the, the gap that may exist as we think about third party data. And, and, then, and then to your point, you know, when you have multiple channels and multiple products, you need a multi-channel, multi-product strategy. And a lot of our data for non-Samsung owners is in these wall gardens. And so that, that presents a challenge. Yeah, I mean, for multi-channel, if you can actually get your own data from other parts of the company into the marketing intelligence, you can be very effective at what's happening. And I think just Bringing up the conversation about data strategy is absolutely critical right now uh, in order to prepare. Okay, we'll take one more question. Well, let's, let's take two quick ones. So with cookies going away, uh, the idea is like with the cookie, you can delete it off your browser if you want, right? Like you can wipe your identity from them. The alternative solutions that are coming out, you can't do that. So why is this better than what we had previously? Ah, it's a great question. So he's saying. Um, the old solution had all, you, you, they could wipe, they'll wipe your data out. Why is the new solution any better? So this gets to the fundamental two types of data that exist. There's deterministic data and probabilistic data. Determin these are great terms. Oh, we're going to geek out. So these are great terms to know for the geek out session. Deterministic means it is connected to an, act an actual person. So you, I have your data, your phone, your specific location, and I can track it depending on what company I am, all the way back to your, um, your credit rating and your, where you live. Right? So that's deterministic data. The other side of this where we think there's a huge opportunity now, and even more with uh, the role of AI coming soon, is probabilistic. I don't know exactly who you are, but I know from this article that you're, you're reading on and maybe from the uh, information I can gather from the device you're on, um, I can create a picture. And AI is gonna allow us to create much better pictures. We're already doing this um, en masse uh, with brands and agencies, so probabilistic data. And that actually allows me to do the targeting without holding on to that deterministic data. So the deterministic data will come, your personal data will only be held 
by the companies that you've granted it access to, like a Samsung, and then they can use that to say, okay, I have this pool of people, I now want to find people like them. I don't really care if it's you in particular, or if it's someone like you, because someone like you has a high propensity to being my customer. So you're seeing that like companies being able to hold on to that specific personal information about you, going away, and creating pools. Which, by the way, that's how we should be marketing anyway. That's how I grew up in marketing. Like, I don't need to know someone's name to market to them. I need to know what, is their, what are their consumer attributes, because that's what I'm really trying to appeal to. That's for cross prospecting, though, right? The targeting is a different story. Right. Well, if you're so, that's he's asking um, what that's for prospecting. What about targeting? Same thing for targeting. I can use probabilistic data at scale to say I'm looking for these kinds of people. What kind of third-party data exists from Experian, Oracle, Condé Nast, all of these places that might have third-party data um, to help me shape a profile and find that person, and then optimize my targeting uh, while I'm in market. Okay, we're going to let you guys geek out after this. Um, five minutes, okay. I've got a, is it quick? Yeah, it's just a statement on to, val to validate everything you said. So I come out of this, so I was at a client this morning. We've got 60 plus million of their customers matched up digitally to a core ID. When they look because of third party deprecation, and I actually took this exact the opportunity to reach Apple users, today they're only recognizing 5% of iOS devices that are coming to their site. Without implementing either a reverse proxy tag or a server to server, they, they just have literally more than half the open web, like they can't even communicate to these people anymore. That's like a huge issue and I would challenge most companies don't realize how big an impact that's going to have on their business. I think it just validates everything that you said. Okay, more geeking out after this. <laughs> um, last question, you mentioned test and learn. Uh, so maybe more broadly than, than the topic of, of cookies, etc. but any thoughts on how brands, marketers should test and learn, like broadly across their, across their strategies? Yeah, and you know, we were talking about this in the context of how as a marketer do you get to do anything new? So before I did this job, I ran an innovations group for eight years at IPG and we worked with every brand and we were the ones that helped drive their business forward, but we had like, I don't know, 5% of the budget, sometimes less, sometimes 10. Um, so how do you make that space for test and learn? So my general philosophy as a marketer is if you're doing one thing and you add a thing, you just doubled your, um, doubled what you're doing in the market, and you're getting smarter twice as fast. So always add that next thing, even if it's small, even if it's a test, um, and make that room for it. Because there's three scenarios that are going to happen when you make the justification for a test and learn, right? Scenario one, you're going to get smarter. You're going to be able to say to um, your CMO, who might have to bring it up in the board, hey, we tried this social platform, and we're the first ones doing it. So I worked with Chipotle at my last company, and we helped put them on to TikTok. By the way, it could have been a massive, massive failure because the brand at the time was having some major issues. It turned out that they embraced the community in a new way, and it was a wild success. But we started small, and we got it started, right? So number one, worst thing that's going to happen if you do it the right way is you're going to Right? Second thing that's going to happen is you might actually find that moment that is the unlock for the next more sincere spend for the brand. So, and you will be checking off back to multi-channel whether or not the channel should be expanding or contracting, which is absolutely critical when you start thinking about channel mix. So, um, always, always, always find that room, even if it's small. I, I've worked with. I will say this. I've worked with Lionsgate on their horror slasher films and put put apps out there that um, well put apps out there that change your voice into the Jigsaw Killer back when no one was making apps. And I've worked with Bayer Pharmaceuticals that turned into one of the biggest innovation clients we uh, we ever worked with with the team. If you approach it in that way, you will be able to sell through test and learn in a new organization. I know we're out of time. Two couple of sentences. How do you drive that um, freedom for your team to test and learn, because most of us, I think, are just heads down, 
you know, eight hours a day, nine hours a day, right. six days a week. How do you create that yes. room? I know, it's all the glamorous moments on film, and, uh, but not, when, when those aren't showing, you're just heads down making it happen and figuring it out. Um, I have a rule for how I manage my teams. I try and figure out what everybody's superpower is on the team. Like, what is the thing that would be amazing if they could do it for the company and they love it? And how do I make that more of their job? And then build into their plans. And I'm doing this right now for my 2024 plan with my team. All right, what's, what are those things that we didn't get to do this year that we think would be amazing or that you personally would love to expand into? The thing about marketing is there are so many ways to win that you can think laterally and still win. There isn't one path for every brand. And so those opportunities where you harness someone's passion and you push it into the, uh, the opportunities of the company, I think that's where I've seen the best results. Great. I think we're up against time. Thank you, Dave. Thank you.